There is something about having over 700 horsepower and rear wheel drive where I'm pretty sure it's mandatory for it to be raining when you're experiencing that. So rather than talk about driving dynamics, let's talk about engines, displacement, RPM, and boost. Hello everyone and welcome. We are sitting inside of the McLaren 750S, the successor to the 720S. And so I want to talk about engines because while this has a special engine, uh, it's nice to think about what are the fundamentals in order to make a boatload of power like this vehicle has. So there are some shared elements that basically all cars that are production cars operate under in that, you know, they're using gas from a gas station. They're using atmospheric air in order to make power. And and they're using you know four stroke engines four stroke is the norm so operating with those fundamental elements there are many different ways that you can make more power but ultimately what you really need to do is get more air in the engine so how do you put more air through an engine well there's three main ways displacement RPM and boost. So I want to talk about each of them. All right, so as far as displacement, this is the swept volume of an engine's piston. So basically, how big is the engine? So for example, again, the theme here being we want more air to go through our engines. So let's say we have a two liter engine and it operates at 6,000 RPM. It maxes out 6,000 RPM. Well, if we want to find out how much air do we have to work with with this engine, well, you have two liters, you multiply that by 6,000 RPM, you divide that by two because you have one intake stroke for every four strokes, which means every two revolutions of that crankshaft. In other words, one for every two RPM. So two times 6,000 divided by two, we have 6,000 liters of air at that max RPM to work with to make power. Okay, so if we wanna make more power using displacement, let's simply double the size of our engine. Now we have a four liter engine operating at 6,000 RPM divided by two, and we have 12,000 liters of air per minute that we have to work with in order to make power. That means we've effectively doubled how much power we can make because we have twice as much air to work with. Now, another strategy you can go with is RPM. So let's say, once again, we have that two liter engine, 6,000 RPM. Now we double the RPM, so 12,000 RPM times two, divided by two, 12,000 liters of air per minute that we have to work with. So we have a much smaller engine, but it's doing all of this twice as fast. Twice as fast that airflow is going through the engine. So it's effectively just like that four liter operating at 6,000 RPM, we're just using a smaller engine, higher RPM, same amount of airflow. We're effectively doubling how much power we have. And then finally, we get to boost. So once again, two liter engine, 6,000 RPM. Now, instead of using this atmospheric pressure, this air that we have around us, which is at about 14.7 PSI, let's just call it 15 PSI. Let's add in additional pressure using a turbocharger or a supercharger into that engine. So our volume of air that's going through the engine, you know, it's basically going to be the same, but we've doubled the pressure. So if we use 15 PSI of boost, 30 PSI absolute pressure going through that engine, doubling our pressure, so two times 6,000 times two divided by two, we get 12,000 liters of air that we have to work with per minute. So again, all of these are different strategies, very different strategies in order to effectively double how much air we've got going through this engine in order to effectively double how much power it makes. Now there's of course efficiency differences and advantages and disadvantages with each strategy. All right, so going back to displacement, why would you choose this method? What are the advantages? Well, it's simple, it can be reliable. It doesn't necessarily mean it will be reliable, but you have lower stresses on your engine internals because you're using atmospheric pressure rather than higher pressures. You're not operating at a really high RPM. So the stresses on your powertrain aren't that high. It means it can be reliable or cheaper to make. Overall, it does tend to be cheaper. It's simple. You know, it's an easy method of making more power and you have a great response, right? Naturally aspirated engines, you've got really good response from them, big benefit from them, low end torque with large displacement engines. So there's a lot of benefits of going this route. A simple example of, you know, an engine using displacement above everything else, Dodge Viper, right? 8.4 liters, it's only revving to 6,200 RPM, but you have 8.4 liters massive engine and so because you have such a large engine it's able to make you know around 650 horsepower all right so why go the rpm route so the big benefit of high rpm means you can use a much smaller engine right so you can double the power output yet not increase your displacement if you double the rpm 
And so this means you use a small engine and it means you save a lot of weight. So there's huge benefits to doing that. The downside, you don't tend to have that much low end torque. So if you have a really, really wide RPM range, well, it's challenging to make really good torque across that RPM range. And so as a result, you push the torque curve so that you make good power at the top end so that the vehicle makes good power. And then you can use gears to get good torque to the wheels. The challenge is if you are at a low RPM and you're driving with this really small engine, it means you're not gonna have much power, you're not gonna have good acceleration on that bottom end. So an example of a car using RPM above everything else, Gordon Murray T50, right? This is a four liter engine, uh, naturally aspirated, so you think, okay, that's not gonna be able to make that much power. Well, it revs to 12,100 RPM. So as a result, much like our Dodge Viper, you know, it's sitting around 650 horsepower, even though it's less than half the size of that Dodge Viper engine because it's revving so high. And finally, we get to boost. And so this is interesting, right? Because if you have an engine, basically a third of that power goes into creating pressure to force down that piston and propel you forward. Another third of that power just goes into the cooling system, completely wasted. And another third of that power just goes out the exhaust. Again, just waste heat. So a turbocharger, what it's doing is taking advantage of that waste heat that's going out the exhaust. That's a lot of power, right? Why not do something with it? So you use that power to spin a turbine. The other end of that is spinning an impeller. You're bringing in with this compressor more air into your engine. You're forcing the pressure to be higher within your engine and thus make way more power. Now the benefit is, again, you can use a smaller engine. Now, weight savings is kind of complicated, right? Because you're adding a turbo, you can be adding intercooling systems. You can add a lot of weight through, you know, liquid intercoolers, air to air intercoolers, your exhaust routing. It does add complexity, right? And so this adds weight, but you can generally speaking, save some weight if it's all done right and use a smaller engine. And another big benefit of that is you can have both power and efficiency in theory. So if you're light on your foot, uh, then you know you get good efficiency because you've got a really small engine that you're working with. And then when you need to make more power, you force a lot more pressure within that engine so that you can make the power. You don't have to carry around this huge engine and make crazy power uh, and then have this wasteful you know, use of mass and space when you don't need all that power. So a good example of an engine using boost above all else is Koenigsegg's tiny friendly giant. Two liter engine, right? But it's operating at about 30 PSI, two bar. So we're tripling how much air we have from the atmosphere within this engine. And because of that little two liter engine revving to 8,500 RPM, it's able to make 600 horsepower. Now on ethanol, right? On pump gas around 500. But point remains, if you look at each one of these engines and you look at their strategy and you multiply that by their RPM and their displacement and the pressures, you can see, you know, they're all around 600, 650 horsepower and they have fairly similar air flows that they're working with. So, you know, that limiting factor, how much air do you have to work with? Then how efficiently can you make power with that air? So you're going to see differences, of course, uh, especially with turbochargers where you're compressing that air, it heats it up means there is going to be some losses associated with that. But regardless, you see there's very different methodologies in order to make a lot of power, each with their own pros and cons. All right, so what the heck does that have to do with the car that we're sitting in, the McLaren 750S? Well, this car employs all three of those strategies in order to create one of the most powerful V8 engines in a production car sold today. So 740 horsepower, if we're talking metric horsepower, it's 750 metric horsepower, whatever a metric horsepower is, and hence you have the name 750S. So we have a four liter V8 engine, so plenty of displacement there. It revs to 8,500 RPM, so high revving engine, and it has twin turbochargers, so boost to go along with it. Now, McLaren will not tell me how much boost it does use, but you know, if you combine these three factors, even with low boost, you can see that the airflow going through this engine is going to be greater than the other examples that I provided. And so it's like pretty obvious that yes, this thing is going to make a ton of power through the result of these different airflow strategies. Now stay with me here because this math is gonna be a tad complex. This is the McLaren 750S. It replaces the McLaren 720S. 750 minus 720 is 30. 30 is the key number here. So this vehicle has 30 more horsepower, 30 more pound-feet of torque. It weighs 30 kilograms less, or about 66 pounds. 
and McLaren says it is 30% all new. So yes, it is very much so uh, an updated 720S, but with 30% new parts going into this vehicle. So with these changes, this car is better in every performance metric versus the 720S, except for top speed. Now why? Well, they use a more aggressive final drive ratio. So they're using a 15% shorter final drive, resulting in better in-gear acceleration in every gear of about 10%. So it's quicker, right? It doesn't have the top speed. I'm sure you'll be bummed to know that it goes down from 212 to 206 miles per hour. Now there's probably very few people who can be like, ah, you know, I've actually gone 212 in a McLaren 720S and I will notice the difference in the 750S. Actually, I get to be one of those few lucky people that has gone 212 miles per hour in the 720S. So in theory, if I were to floor it, not gonna do it because it's raining, I'm on a public road, but the top speed would be about six miles per hour lower. Now, here's the thing with the 750 and the 720S. The 720S was already this bonkers machine, right? Like it accelerated, it was crazy how good it is at acceleration, especially when you just look at it on paper and you say, okay, 710 horsepower, rear wheel drive, open differential, how quick's it really gonna be? Then compare it to say something like a Bugatti Veyron, right? 16 cylinders, four turbochargers, all wheel drive, a thousand horsepower, right? This thing's meant to be insanely quick in a straight line. 720S is quicker in the quarter mile, right? That's crazy. The 720S, the on paper is just like, okay, yeah, 700 horsepower, which like, I guess these days is nothing, huh? It's insane how fast this thing is. And this is significantly quicker. So while the 720S was doing zero to 124 miles per hour or 200 kilometers per hour in 7.8 seconds, this is doing it in 7.2 seconds. Yes, this car right here can get to 124 miles per hour, 200 kilometers per hour, faster than a modern Nissan Altima can hit 60 miles per hour. Nissan Altima, the pinnacle of performance, we all agree. Again, the numbers are just bonkers. The 750S can hit 300 kilometers per hour, 186 miles per hour in under 20 seconds in the coupe, just over 20 seconds in the Spider, which is what we're sitting in. Now for the 720S, McLaren says it can do the quarter mile in 10.3 seconds, and this can do the quarter mile in 10.1 seconds. Well, actually, it's been tested in the 720S that it could hit the quarter mile in 10.1 seconds, stock 720S. So in reality, this thing might be able to crest into the nines for the quarter mile. Production car, rear wheel drive, open differential, like absolutely nuts how quick this thing is. It's hypercar performance, you know, for $400,000, which yes, is still an absurd amount of money. But when you start looking at what it can hang with, you know, suddenly, okay, maybe not so crazy of a price tag. It's right there with the Senna in terms of acceleration. Now, the Spider is about 50 kilograms heavier than the Coupe, and so you might wonder, well, on a day like today when it's raining, are there actually any advantages of going with the Spider versus the Coupe? Glad you asked. This lovely button right here rolls down our window. Couple down shifts. sounds put that down <laughs> right when you let off that sh <laughs> now I'd love 
love to be able to tell you what this thing is like to drive. And you know, here I am driving it, right? There are some changes, like it has a sharper steering rack. So you know, you've got very quick, very responsive turn in. The steering feels great. McLaren, one of the very few remaining still using hydraulic steering. They've got an updated version of their proactive chassis control. So we're on the third version of that in this car. Slightly softer springs up front, slightly stiffer in the rear. It's got a larger, 20% larger wing back there, but reality is on today, I'm not gonna be able to tell you what this thing's really like to drive. Uh, it's a little wet and I've got way too much power and only two wheels driven in order to find out what the acceleration really feels like. There's a reason why I mostly just talked about engines. But overall, this is taking the 720S and just taking it to another level. So lightweighting through the use of lightweight hood, lightweight wheels, lightweight exhaust, lightweight seats. It's adding power, a little bit more boost. They actually had to add a fuel pump, so instead of one fuel pump, this has two fuel pumps in order to compensate for the extra fuel needed. To compensate for that added pressure in the engine, it's got a triple layer head gasket instead of the dual layer that was used in the 720S. And with this added power, you get shorter gearing, so you actually get significantly quicker acceleration. Again, 0.6 seconds quicker to 200 kilometers per hour than the 720S. That's a big difference. So the 720S already had insane performance and we're just taking that up a bit. Now I am gonna be going out on a track later today and hopefully it's not quite as wet and I actually get to feel what the car is like at the limit. There are a couple cool videos I'd recommend checking out. I have a video on McLaren's proactive chassis control and how that works in the 720S. It's a really cool, really clever system that's very unlike what other supercars out there use as far as their suspension. And also, if you're curious to see what it looks like to drive on a public road over 200 miles per hour, well, I have a video doing that in the 720S. Thank you all so much for watching, and if you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below.